Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, first ever uh, Derek in the District uh, show. Um, this is going to be a, uh, a monthly show really highlighting some of the great things that are going on in the 19th House District, in case you're wondering uh, where that is or what that is. Uh, most of it is... Uh, is uh, West Hartford. There is uh, a portion of Avon and Farmington too. I am the uh, newly elected uh, state representative uh, in the district and it's an, an honor to serve you. Um, and there's lots, as you know, going on uh, with the state right now, uh, the state budget, education funding, all sorts of issues. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having this dialogue uh, with you uh, for this half an hour and then in um, months to come. So the format of this new show uh, is we're going to be talking um, in this uh, edition, if you will, about uh, education. And we have on two very uh, special guests, the uh, superintendent of the West Hartford Public Schools, uh, Tom Moore, and uh, the teacher of the year in West Hartford, Luis Ramirez. So we'll be talking... 10 minutes about some of the issues about the, uh, you know, with the beginning of the new school year and uh, the impact that the uh, state budget crisis has on the public schools. Then in, in the second segment, um, we're trying out a new name here and it's going to be Slap Salutes. And we're going to highlight um, some local heroes, uh, some folks and businesses who are really going above and beyond to help our community. And then we're going to take questions from you in the last segment. Uh, so uh, let's get right to it with our two uh, special guests. Um, thank you, by the way, very much yeah, for uh, joining me uh, on the show. Um, and uh, Tom, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, we have the disadvantage of taping this right now before we know uh, the very latest uh, with uh, the state budget. Uh, but let me ask you kind of broadly, how does the uncertainty with the state budget uh, impact uh, the public schools right now? Uh, I would say that the biggest impact right now is anxiety and not knowing because for school systems, in schools and classrooms, anxiety is the enemy. We want our teachers not worried about their jobs. We want our kids not worried about who are they gonna have as a teacher coming in. So really, the not knowing is the enemy. And, you know, last year, we did, at the end of the budget, cut 16 positions from West Hartford Public Schools. So we've already had a significant hit from this. We've tried to keep them as far away from the students as possible, but that's a lot of support staff that we don't have now. And we're, we're frankly dependent on the state, and the governor's proposal is frightening for us. Right, and you mentioned the governor's proposal, and uh, you know the initial proposal was uh, there was a net uh, cut to West Hartford of about 14 million, yeah. and then when revenues continued to fall, that was up to about 20 million dollars. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, you know, frankly, th that was something that uh, myself and the, uh, the other members of the delegation uh, were, have been fighting against. Um, and there is this notion among some, and I think, you know, the governor included, um, that West Hartford uh, is a, you know, quote unquote, rich district, right, and can afford um, yeah. these cuts, essentially. Um, you know, and I, you and I have talked about that, um, and there's really a misperception there, isn't there? Isn't Abs there? Absolutely. We're, and Lewis sees this every day in his role as a school social right. worker where he's reaching out and helping kids and helping families that I think people sometimes just come to our restaurants and think, isn't everything lovely here? And West Hartford is lovely. And the very diversity that we're talking about, both racially and economically, is one of the reasons why I want to live here, why my kids are here, so that they see what the real world is. And it's not a homogeneous environment. But with that comes challenges. And when you're talking about 10 to 15 percent of a school system's budget to be cut, uh, it would be catastrophic. Right. And, you know, we see that and you see it, you know, really on the, the front lines here in terms of um, what a, a special district we have. Right. And some of the challenges that go along with it. Uh, we have folks who live in multi-million dollar homes. And uh, at the same time, we have folks who grow up, let's say, food insecure. Right. Who right. don't know where, you know, um, if their parents can afford to keep food on the plate. And we have them in the same classroom, which I think and I know you just mentioned Fantastic. is remarkable. It's such a great thing. Um, what kind of challenges and opportunities does that provide, Louis? Well, I'm, you know, first, I'm, I'm very proud to work uh, at Smith STEM School, where there's over uh, 12, 13 languages spoken. We have many families that come from very diverse demographic, economic backgrounds. Uh, and with that, um, as unique as it is and as special as it is, 
Uh, there's also a lot of risk factors um, that uh, many elementary schools and schools in West Hartford also face. Um, and some of those, as you had just mentioned, are some financial burdens. Others are also uh, family dynamics that sometimes play a critical role uh, in children's ability to learn and have uh, total success in the school. Um, so, you know, along with those risk factors, what we try to do is also collaborate as a close team um, and also really um, have an ownership and a responsibility to the families and the students to really establish a strong relationship so that when there are trying times throughout the year, we're able to overcome them. Yeah, now, um, I should congratulate you on being Thank Teacher you so much. of the Year. So what do you get for Teacher of the Year? Do you have a trophy or something? <laughs> or what? There was a, a lot of wonderful recognition. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's a tremendous honor, not just for myself, but, but the entire department as far as to be recognized, uh, as far as the support staff um, that, that we are able to provide in schools to individuals um, and also to families throughout West Hartford. I think it's a unique testament to West Hartford and really, the family of educators that the teacher of the year is a social worker mm -hmm. because it, the interconnectedness of what we do to make sure kids are okay is imperative for them to be able to succeed in the classroom. And so I, I think it's just a uh, great recognition for the work of all social workers that Lewis represents. Absolutely. And thank you for all that you do for, uh, for our kids. I have three uh, children in the district too, so uh, not only am I interested from a pub public policy perspective, but also personally as well. I have two at Sedgwick Middle School and one uh, at Duffy going into kindergarten. Um, so as a parent, uh, and, and this show I should say is going to be, um, we'll run through the month of September. What are some new things, some things that parents should know about, right, as, they, as the new school year starts? Um, what's your message to them? Well, I think one of the key things is people are always looking for something new. And there's a lot of things with the budget where we're going forward, we're continuing to work, but you're not going to see new programs. And that's some of the, sometimes some of the problems when you look at capital expenditures mm -hmm. and people are thinking, well, what are you spending money on? They don't see it. They don't see roofs. They don't see masonry. It's all those things that there's nothing necessarily flashy opening now as when we had the new Charter Oak opening, but it's an investment in people. And really what I say to parents as they start the school year, especially um, incoming kindergarten parents or people that have moved here, is we have to have a partnership. And I mean that. And you have to give your children the power to talk to their teachers and you have to share with us your concerns about your children. Luis is much better off when a parent reaches out to him and tells him, we're worried about this at home. And yep. so that gives him, I think, an entree into that discussion with the child. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that, um, that rich discussion and that relationship, um, you know, more than half of what I do is relationship building. Um, and as Mr. Moore said, uh, it's critical because uh, sometimes, um, you know, a child might be presenting with different behaviors or, you know, possibly acting out in class or throughout the school day. And, you know, there's a lot of question marks. And what's really important is try to connect the dots mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and try to make a connection as to is something going on at home? Is something else going on that, that might be a little more stressful for that child or for the family that they're going through that maybe staff's not aware of? So to have that awareness, then we're, be we're better able to identify with the problem is and then uh, and the challenges and then be, uh, be able to address them right no that makes sense so as a legislator right, I'm fighting for absolutely you know as much funding for uh, the district uh, as possible and as we've stated uh, the opposition frankly right is is our governor who wants to cut funding and send it to other districts um, so funding is something I assume that uh, you as educators in West Hartford need from the state um, is it what else what, what other supports um, can the state provide or and sometimes it's things that we do and sometimes it's things that we don't do right that's helpful yes. as well and that and that's you and I have discussed um, some of the red tape or burdens that are put on districts and you've been a great friend in this is try to help us move away from some of the mandates that the state puts and every time there's a mandate I understand exactly why the legislature did it you know you need to do this you need to do this but sometimes there's so many things that you have to train teachers in all of these areas. Well, when do we get to talk about reading and mm -hmm. writing and mathematics? And, and those are the kind of things that I think your help in making sure that we keep education about education um, is really important to us, that we're making sure that we're focused on producing um, children and adults who can be productive members of West Hartford, Connecticut, and the world.
That's the goal, right? Well, so we have about 30 seconds left. What do you think, uh, you know, from, from an uh, well, educator's perspective? Well, from an educator's perspective, especially from my unique position as a school social worker and support staff, is I think that's something that's very important, um, both for policymakers uh, and, and for others to be aware of, is uh, the mental health implications at a young age throughout the school systems. Um, you know, many adolescents and children are, are, you know, diagnosed, you know, with different illnesses, and I think that uh, it's very important to uh, both identify them and that the school plays a critical role with that, um, as well as be able to um, uh, also work um, in hand with uh, stakeholders and other community uh, folks so that we can uh, better address the issues, um, you know, and, and also obviously support the children so that they have academic and social and behavioral success throughout the school day. Right, and I know we'll continue to have this dialogue. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens with the state budget. Hopefully we have resolution very soon. Uh, thank you both for coming on. Thanks and for having and us. Spending some, uh, some time with me and, and all of you. Uh, again, Tom Moore, who's our school superintendent, and then Luis Ramirez, who is the uh, Teacher of the Year in West Hartford. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back. This is a uh, new segment that um, we are calling uh, Slap Salute, and i um, having a little fun with the name, um, but uh, the topic is really important. It's to highlight um, positive things that are going on in our community, and specifically um, people and businesses who are really going above and beyond and um, doing the things that are uh, inspirational and that uh, help uh, others and help our economy. Um, and so right now I want to introduce two people who are doing exactly that. Um, and uh, John Boyne is the uh, manufacturing manager at uh, Legrand Wire Mold. It's a company that in uh, some form or another has been in West Hartford for what, about uh, 100 Over years? Over 100 years. Right? Yeah. So that in and of itself is uh, something worth celebrating. And John is here with uh, uh, Allison Hung. Did I pronounce yes. the name right? Okay. Um, and and uh, Allison has, is, lives in Avon and has been working at the company um, for how many years, Allison? Three. Three years. Okay. So uh, you may be uh, listening to this and say, all right, so what, so, you know, what is, is so important that's going on here with this employee and employer relationship? Um, and, and the answer is that uh, John and his company uh, has decided to uh, employ folks uh, with intellectual disabilities. Um, and that's uh, something that can present its own kind of challenges and opportunities as well. And that's what some, one of the things that we want to talk about. Um, but it's a it's a win win uh, for the employee, right, and the employer, and something that is so important. And really, the the point of this segment too is to highlight it and encourage uh, other businesses to act like uh, Legrand and to step forward. And we know a lot are, but to get even more uh, to do that. Um, so, John, why don't we start with you and tell sure. us. Um, you know, your perspective about why it's so important, why you guys decided to, uh, to step up um, and hire folks uh, who do have uh, disabilities. Well, we've been part of the community for, like you said, over 100 years. Um, we've had uh, generations of families that work at, at Wiremold. So we really believe in being part of the community. We do four to six big events, whether it's Habitat for Humanity or uh, work at a women's shelter, that kind of thing each year. And this was a great opportunity that came to us uh, through a uh, uh, a meeting at a uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting where uh, the favorite people met um, the plant manager, Michael Kajak, and came up with this idea. So it's been a great thing now for three years. Um, Allison and uh, Nick and Heather and Jessica, they come in and with big smiles every day. Uh, so you can see the win for them. But the win for us is uh, they do good work, good production. They're part of the production team. Uh, they do sub-assemblies and packaging for us and support both retail lines as well as some of our growth lines. So it's, it's good for us. Great, and you've been doing it for how long now? So you three years. Partnership? Three, three years, years. Yep. and Allison, that's how long you've been, yes. right? She's um, an original, yeah. So uh, can you talk about uh, how um, having this job makes you feel and what you get out of it? I package electric outlets and they get sold at Home Depots and Lowe's. Great, and so, and how does that make you feel coming to work uh, every day? I gotta earn my own money and pay my own taxes. Wow, so you pay your own taxes, and some people wouldn't like that, right? Say, so, well, you gotta pay your taxes, but that's remarkable that you, um, you take a lot of pride in that, yeah. right? Yeah, and so what's, your, what's the, the daily um, responsibilities? You know, what, what is the day like for you when you go to work? I work from 10 to 2, Monday through Friday. Okay, and what type of things do you do when, uh, when you get there? I package electric outlets yeah. 
and they get sold at Home Depots and Lowe's. And um, the people you work with, uh, can you talk to me? I uh, work with four people from La Grand Wild, and I have a supervisor, job coach from 10 to 2, Monday through Friday. Great. And so, um, John, if I could turn back to you for sure. a moment. Um, can you talk about how it works, you know, um, having uh, Allison and many other people there at, um, at your facility and how they can integrate with the people who've been there longer in terms of Sure, we, we have a, a special manufacturing cell uh, that we built for them uh, before they came. They go to the same cell uh, every day. It's in the middle of one of our buildings, so they interface with the, uh, I, I, uh, the International Union uh, electrical workers every day. Uh, the people have embraced them. Uh, there's, there's daily interface with the people, so uh, I applaud the IBEW for really embracing the process. So it's it's a win-win-win. It's a win for them, a win for the union, and a win for the company as well. Sure. Yeah, and what about the other employers? What has what their um, you know response been? And it seems like they're very uh, receptive. The to other them, employees? Right? Absolutely. Or the other employees, I should yeah, say. Yeah, they, they uh, uh, every day this morning, actually, they were asking when they get to see Allison on TV. You know, they're all excited about it, and they... Uh, that we we welcome them and we walk in the door. If you look at Allison's smile, there are four people that walk in with that smile every day, along with their job coach. Uh, wow! And that's nice to see. It sounds like Allison that your presence at the community, uh, or at the rather at the um, at the business, is really kind of inspirational, yeah. right, to others. How, how does that make you feel to know that you have such a positive impact on other people? Uh, happy. It makes you feel happy. Yeah. What would you be doing if you weren't um, going to work every I day? I would stay at home and do nothing. I wouldn't be able to earn my own money and pay my own taxes. Wow. And so uh, every day you think you would probably just stay at home? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what, what does your family uh, think of this uh, job that you have and the responsibilities and paying your own way and all that? What do they think? I like it. Yeah. Do they what, do they talk to you about um, you know your job and yeah. what you do? Yes. Yeah. What type of things do they tell you? What do I do during the day? They ask you, right? Yeah. So when you come home, do you have uh, what are, what are the conversations like at the dinner table when you get home? Uh, what do I do during the day and other stuff? Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's and that's pretty normal in terms of that's the conversations that we all have, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, one of the reasons too that I wanted to make sure that we have um, that we have both of you on is because we're discussing uh, an ongoing you know budget uh, impasse, uh, and it's possible that by the time this is taped, that it will be resolved. We hope so, but regardless, there's going to be fiscal challenges mm -hmm. in the state for a while, um, and this is something right that is impacted by uh, the state because um, you all get some state funding. Uh, right to help uh, kind of subsidize uh, mm -hmm. the job, and I know that uh, the state uh, and and um, you know through our public schools too uh, helps to uh, support education right for all children, uh, including folks of course with disabilities through a certain point, and then uh, if this funding goes away. As Allison, as you mentioned, right, if there was no funding at all, you would be home, right, mm -hmm. instead of uh, at a uh, add a job and, and furthering to develop your own skills and help the company. So um, I think when, when we talk about how to resolve the budget deficit, um, these are things that we need to keep in mind, right? That I think the numbers um, in a line item in a budget, there are people really behind e each of these. And I think sometimes that's easy for folks to, uh, to lose track of. Um, so what are your plans for the, for the business? And uh, I assume you continue uh, this partnership? Right? We will continue the partnership, it really works so very well for us and it, it, uh, they're part of the team so when you talk about funding if, if there weren't the funding at the funding say were cut right. they're part of our production strategy right now um, as Allison said she makes parts for Home Depot um, if Allison wasn't there we'd still have to find a way to make parts for Home Depot so uh, we'd really be missing something key we have every intention mm -hmm. again the company uh, and the union uh, in favor of continuing forward with this mm -hmm. so, yeah, and you know, do you ever go into Home Depot, Allison, and look and see? I made that. Yeah. You ever do that? Yeah. I would. T I would totally do that. That would. Be, that would be awesome. I mean, I could never make anything that Home Depot would ever sell. So kudos uh, to you. I mean, that's such a, a great accomplishment, and uh, to be in a place like 
Home Depot is mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, anything, any message that you have or anything that you want to say to, let's imagine that there are uh, businesses or employers uh, who are watching this and thinking, huh, you know, uh, maybe this is a program that I would want to do. What would you say to those employers? Would you like to do the job? Yeah. So ask them, right, if, would they like the job and would they like it probably to have somebody like you working there, yeah. right? I would think the answer would be yes. Right. If I if I owned a business, mm -hmm. I would hire you in a second. So, um, and any kind of last uh, thoughts, John? You have? It's just a, a a great project, a great program for us, and we have every intention of continuing. All right, thanks, guys, and, and thank you so much for coming in. So if you would like uh, more information about getting involved uh, with uh, the uh, ARC program and if your employer and you'd uh, you know, be interested in, in hiring somebody with an intellectual disability, I want to put up some information on the screen right now for you. You should contact uh, Bill Negus. He is the business developer uh, with the ARC of the Farmington Valley. Um, it is 225 Commerce Drive in Canton, Connecticut, and the phone number um, is 860-539-4583. You can also email Bill at W and then N-E-A-G-U-S at and then F-A-V-A-R-H dot org. We'll be right back. Welcome back for our uh, final segment. We are going to be taking some questions from folks who live in West Hartford about hot topics um, that are uh, on their minds. And the first one is about the importance of funding local education. I hope the state government continues to support school funding. I think uh, Connecticut public schools are among the best in the country, and I don't want to see a decline in how we educate our students. Well, that's certainly a great question about uh, funding education, how important it is, and it really speaks to the challenges that we have right now in the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, the, most of our deficit, if you look at it, $2.2 billion in the current fiscal year, 1.7 of that is due to 70, 80 years of Democrats and Republicans on both sides underfunding state employee pension, retiree health care, and uh, the teachers' uh, retirement, teachers' pension funds. Um, so 1.7 of the 2.2. And 30% of our revenues now go towards paying off those, what I call, uh, sins of the past. So the problem is that it's crowding out spending on really important things that are core government functions. Education is absolutely one of those. I would say transportation infrastructure is another one because if you think about it, government, we need to educate people and we need to uh, create an infrastructure by which it'll be attractive to uh, private uh, development, right? Private investment. And that's the way we really grow our economy. So it's critical that we don't uh, pull the plug on education funding. And if you look at West Hartford specifically, our per pupil spending is actually uh, relatively low when you compare uh, to other municipalities in the state. So I think uh, West Hartford has done uh, a great job of, um, you know, creating a top class uh, educational system, not only um, in the state, but really in the country, um, and doing it, you know, keeping in mind how important uh, taxpayer money is, um, doing it really on a budget. Um, so we need to fight against uh, deep, deep cuts uh, to education. It's not going to be tough because there's a lot of pressure uh, going in the other direction, but I'm, I'm absolutely committed to uh, doing my best uh, to protect our public schools. And uh, now let's go to the next question. I believe that's about uh, pay equity. This year, I know you were a big supporter of pay equity. Will you continue to push for that legislation next session? All right, great question about uh, pay equity. As some of you may know, pay equity and closing the gender wage gap was a top priority of mine uh, this past session. And it was actually one of the first bills uh, that I introduced. Um, and it was modeled after a uh, bipartisan bill in our neighboring state of Massachusetts that actually passed unanimously in uh, both uh, chambers of their General Assembly and was signed into law by the governor. So um, let me uh, explain uh, briefly what that bill did that I proposed, um, what happened to it, and then what the plans are for this coming session. But before I do that, I just want to back up for a moment 
and explain, if I can, um, why pay equity or this gender wage gap um, is such a problem that we all, both parties and everybody, needs to come together to work on. Uh, right now in Connecticut, women earn, on average, about 83, 84 cents on the dollar for the same job uh, that a man does. And this uh, costs women and their families thousands and thousands of dollars every single year, well more than $10,000 on average. And of course, the higher up in the pay scale you go, uh, the bigger uh, the discrepancy. Um, and it really helps to um, uh, keep uh, women in poverty, keep them in poverty, keep them uh, more reliant on government assistance in some cases. And it's, uh, it's a discouragement for women to get back into the workforce. It's bad for our economy. And uh, beyond all that, it's also not fair. And at the current rate, it's going to take us about 60 years uh, until uh, to finally kind of close that gender gap. And I think that is far too long to wait. Uh, I have uh, two daughters, uh, ages 12 and 11. And if you think about it, they will miss out at the current you know, projections, the current trend continues for their entire career they'll most likely never be paid what they're worth, never be paid fairly. And I think uh, as a father um, and, uh, and as a husband, um, that is simply unacceptable. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, you probably agree with me. So the question is, what can we do about it? And Massachusetts took a very innovative approach, and now other states have followed, and they have banned the pay history question. So what it means is that an employer cannot ask a potential employee how much do you currently make? <clears throat> and it may seem like, well, you know what, what kind of difference is that gonna make? But women have disproportionately what we call a salary anchor. So if you're paid uh, less than you should be, right, and you take that from one job to the next, to the next, to the next, and it kind of follows you through your entire career. <clears throat> so the belief is that if we get rid of that salary history question, and instead of asking, what do you currently make, right, employers would say, well, how much do you want to make, right? What's your number? That type of thing, right? Um, so you can still have that back and forth. You can still have a negotiation, um, but it doesn't start off penalizing women. And of course, this helps men as well, because sometimes if, if a, a man was paid uh, you know, under market value, uh, then this would allow that person uh, to get back on, on better footing. And I've heard from many of my colleagues uh, in uh, the House, uh, men included, that th they think that this is a good thing. Uh, sometimes men uh, take a job, um, let's say a man takes a job um, you know, that uh, he thought he could have been paid more for, um, you know, but he took it because he wanted to be employed. Uh, well, he doesn't want to be penalized right, for that decision. Um, or conversely, if he takes a job and he's very highly paid, Right? He doesn't want a potential employer to say, oh, you know what, forget it. I see how much you make and we can't afford you. So um, it's about freedom, it's about uh, flexibility, and it's ultimately about fairness. Okay, so I proposed this bill this past session. Um, there was um, some opposition, I should say, um, from some from from some folks uh, in the uh, business community who had concerns about it. Um, they wanted to see how it played out right, in Massachusetts and other states uh, which were going first. Um, we have seen that this has not been a deterrent to attracting and growing jobs and strengthening our economy. In fact, the Boston Chamber of Commerce led the charge in Massachusetts, uh, the state that, as uh, you all know, General Electric moved to its headquarters. Um, Boston and the state of Massachusetts, their economy is going gangbusters. Other states have followed suit. So I think uh, now is the time, this next year, we ultimately got a kind of watered uh, down bill out of the House and it did not make it out of the Senate. Um, so this next year, I'm gonna be pushing for it in a bipartisan way, working with Republicans from the very beginning to craft something that we can all get behind and I think finally kind of break the cycle and help ensure uh, that our daughters, that our wives, our um, grandmothers, uh, you know, that uh, all the women uh, in our life are finally paid fairly. Um, so we have time for one more question, and so let's go to that right now. What can Connecticut now. do to improve our economy and be more competitive with other states? There's really nothing more important, if you think about it, uh, for the state of Connecticut right now than strengthening our economy and growing jobs. Um, so how do we do that? Three uh, quick uh, bullet points that I have uh, to get us uh, on a stronger path. One is we need budget sustainability, right? We can't be going through a budget crisis and uncertainty every two years uh, or even sooner. So one, we need a balanced, affordable, sustainable budget. Two, we need to be bold. We need to say, 
Connecticut is open for business. And I'm pushing an idea and I have you know, support from many of my colleagues in the legislature right now uh, to consider zeroing out the corporate, in, in, uh, corporate income tax, I should say, in our distressed municipalities, right, for uh, a certain amount of time. Uh, and that's to give a message to corporations who are considering coming into the state, we are open for business. Um, so we need to be bold. And finally, we need to continue to make critical investments in transportation, education, right? Things that are uh, going to keep uh, Connecticut a thriving state and keep Connecticut a state where people want to come to. Um, so there's many other things we need to do, but uh, we need to really try to accomplish those things and do it in a bipartisan way if we can. That is all the time uh, we have uh, for this first edition of Derek in the District. Thank you so much for watching. I do want to put up my email address. It's Derek, D-E-R-E-K dot slap, S-L-A-P, at C-G-A dot C-T dot gov. If you have questions that you want to send me, um, you need assistance in any way, you want to chat, you want to vent, anything, I'm here for you. Uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing this dialogue next month. So long. Thank you.